Hello and welcome to Statistically Insignificant, a glorified slideshow about statistics in the world. My name is Tess, my pronouns are she, they, and I'm here armed with a megaphone and a sign at a counter-protest to a bunch of cooked units screaming about critical race theory in schools. Unfortunately, Bart was unable to come to this snap protest as he's on holiday, but behind us, someone is setting up his amp and guitar to droid out the racist speakers through the power of music. It's Leon Stevenson. Kia ora ehoa, how's it going? Good, good. Uh, you got my last name wrong, by the way. Steven, oh my god, I have <laughs> I have it right on the next line, but it's Liam Stevens, not Liam Stevens. Yeah, I am so yeah. sorry. <laughs> I corrected one. Yeah. Liam Stevens is a Maori who draws Whaka Papa, genealogy or ancestry, to Ngati Kuhununu Ki Taiwaiora on the east coast of Aotearoa, New Zealand. He is a game designer, podcaster, and cultural consultant under the name Toa Tabletop. Hi. Kia ora. Today, we're going to be doing one of the first episodes I ever actually started drafting, way back in 2018, in fact. It's time to talk about blood quantum. We'll get to what that is if the term is unfamiliar to you in just a second, but I have to open with a content warning, as frequently is the case, it seems, that we'll be talking about such invigorating topics as genocide, racism, forced child removal, slavery, and rape. I'll be talking from my perspective as someone who is both Pakeha, that is, descended from European colonizers in Aotearoa, and Māori, with my whakapapa coming from the Hokianga region. While Liam and I can talk from the Māori experience, we are going to talk about the experiences of other colonized people, as well as those subjected to the transatlantic slave trade. Mm. Please don't take our word to be definitive on their experiences. I should also say that I am recording and producing this on the lands of the Darawal people. Uh, I would like to acknowledge their elders past and present and whose sovereignty was never ceded. Mm. So, blood quantum. It's an effort to quantify a person's race based on the race of their ancestors. We will talk about the history, but as a bit of foreshadowing, it's been constructed for and used as part of settler colonial violence and racist power structures for a few hundred years, in more or less explicit form depending on the case in question. I will be drawing a lot on the work of the late Australian historian Patrick Wolfe. Wolfe's work focused on settler colonial structures across history and the world, and the ways in which uh, I've got a typo here, and the ways in which race categorization and hierarchy were constructed according to the political necessity of the colonizer, and as sometimes as a form of anti-colonial resistance as well. Fundamental to blood quantum is the notion that race is a meaningful categorization, that at some point in history there were distinct races, and that if you can get access to information on those people and their descendants, you can determine how pure, with many air quotes, or mixed, the race is for people living now. The word quantum in this context is indicating this is about measuring units of race. It has nothing to do with the physics, which also borrowed the term. In this imagined age of racial purity, someone's race was directly tied to their geography, which was then taken to determine absolutely their physiological characteristics. This is where the notion of an English or a Polish race comes from, but that was a latter use of what was constructed during the expansion of European imperial powers to colonies elsewhere in the world. Of course, the categorization applied to colonized people were never as nuanced as those applied to the white Europeans, and in fact, explicit efforts were made to homogenize populations that were both transported through the transatlantic slave trade in order to break power structures and kinship relationships, and also homogenization of native people in order to reduce the quite vibrant diversity of nations and peoples that existed in those areas. This led to the use of physical characteristics like skin color because it's much easier to assign a classification to people by looking at them, but the experience of being racialized through your skin color has not been the same for people with similar levels of melanin. For example, indigenous people in Australia were called black, but their experience of being racialized has more in common with native peoples elsewhere in the world, like the US, New Zealand, or Brazil, than it does the black slaves who were transported out of Africa and their descendants. When we're talking about this stuff, it's really important to notice the differences as well as the similarities, and to observe the role that that political structure plays to construct those features. Whatever system we use to construct race, it's fundamentally a bad one because race is a really shitty categorization system. 
Cultural identities are far more complex, fluid, socially constructed, and subject to political pressures than systems of racial classification have ever acknowledged because they are structured specifically to deny the agency and the identity of the people who are lower on the race structure than others. So the next bit, we're going to talk about the maths that uh, comes from this quantification system. We're going to assume that there is a way to build such classification and run with that to look at how the maths get screwed up, but there isn't. And we're going to talk about many of the reasons why there isn't and why even the existing classifications are bad uh, when we get to talk about the history and politics. For the math, this really comes down to how many ancestors you have and different groups that they belong to. So if there's uh, you down here, so there's a particular person, mm -hmm. they're going to have two biological parents, right? Each of whom has two biological parents. So we're going to call these grandparent one, grand, uh, point one, grandparent 1.2, and then we got grandparent 2.1 and grandparent 2.2. And you could expand this up, right? You get eight at the next level, 16, 32, 64, and so yeah. on. So yeah. basically for each step here, we have two ancestors. Up here, we get two squared, then two to the third, so this is four, this is eight. So basically each time you go back, assuming no crossover, we're going to get back to this in a second, you multiply the number of people you are related to by two. This is a bit of a problem uh, because... The reality is human ancestry doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. As an example, right, if you go this, like, two to the number of generations, 32 generations gives us approximately 7 billion uh, relatives that far back. It's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. Yeah, 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 right. There's about, what, 7, 8 billion people alive today, and this is yeah, the yeah. max number of people who have ever been alive, as far as we know. Also, 32 generations, if you assume that there's roughly a 25-year gap between parent and child at each step, that's only 800 years. Mm. Mm. 800 years ago, it's thought that the global population was about 400 million people. So that's an order of magnitude less than this would propose. So already you can see that by necessity, there has to be some overlap somewhere. And in fact... By the necessity of being a species, there is in fact overlap. We are all related at some point in the past. Mm. Oh, yeah, I mean, obviously, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. But like, <laughs> but like the, the calculations that go into blood quantum kind of assume that that doesn't happen. Mm. I mean, it, like realistically, they only trace back a few generations because, well, I mean, well, there are there are questions around like how far back you want to calculate this for native people in particular, like the idea of being one thirty second, some indigenous uh, people is a bit um, fraught, mm. let's say, but that's the sort of level at which people are looking. And well, uh, one thirty second. So if we're looking at that, we generally took talk about like this blood quantum idea as fractions of the whole. And they're based on multiples or like powers of a half to some number, we'll call it K. So if you go uh, one person and their parents, and their parents are, say, A and B race, again, these are not good classifications, then the person is a half A and a half B, right? Mm. We can extend that back. So if you have, let's say we've got a half A, a half B for parent one, and then we have C over here. This is one C. Then this person is a quarter A, a quarter B, and half C. So here, this a quarter is a half squared, right? Because it's back a generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is how we get to the idea of, well, one thirty second whatever just means you're far enough back and have basically one ancestor from that group that 
as that goes down the generations, it gets, and I hate this term, but I'm going to use it because it's the term that gets used, diluted mm. to the level of being one thirty second of the composite of your ancestry at a given point. Mm. As a bit more foreshadowing, let's say that this <laughs> has problems. And in particular, given that we now have these genealogical testing companies like 23andMe and Ancestry.com, where you can send off a little sample of your DNA and they'll tell you you're 90% English or something like that, that's slightly problematic. Mm. I'm also going to point out that from a mathematical perspective, what you get from these like a half multiplied out so many times is on the bottom here, you get numbers like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, powers of 2 on the bottom. A third is not a power of 2. So in fact, you don't get those sorts of fractions that are not a power of 2. What you get from like 23andMe and these other like ancestry genealogy companies is a slightly different calculation, but it is still a form of blood quantum in a sense because it is still identifying an amount of a person descended from a particular area. To me, the notion of blood quantum is directly in conflict with ideas that come from other places about genealogy. So the one I'm particularly interested to talk to Liam about is the Maori notion of whakapapa, which in my head says that we are a product of all of our ancestors, regardless of genetic contribution, and often as a result of adoption instead of direct like blood relation. Mm. So Liam, could you tell us about Whakapapa and how that is related to, distinct from, these ideas of blood quantum? Oh, yeah, sure. So um, Whakapapa, uh, really, the word translates to a few things. Yeah, there's the concept of Whakapapa, which we're about to talk about, but, and I think this is important, it also is the word you'd use to describe layers of things. Mm. And we actually use it to talk about the flax bush, because that grows in like a layered pattern, right? There's the new shoots coming up in the middle and the older shoots on the outside. Mm. So when you think about that, when we talk about whakapapa in terms of genealogy and, and lineage, we're, we're ultimately saying the same thing. We're, we're looking conceptually at our, ourselves as these layers of an expanding sort of fern bush, right? Now, the concept of whakapapa is really because, you know, tongues of whenua, Māori, uh, ultimately like an ancestor sort of, um, we, we worship our ancestors, right? Our, our tūpuna, as we call them, are very important to us. So it's very common for us to track our, our whakapapa and know who we came from, where they come from, uh, what they did, etc. It was an important part of our oral history. Now, the way it works here is if you can draw whakapapa back to one Māori, one tangata whenua, you are Māori, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really that simple. There's no, like, you can't, when when we because because we're not talking just about genetic makeup here, we're talking about our intrinsic being, who we are. Mm. You can't partially be somebody, right? Yeah. Like you are, you're either that thing or you are not. Now it's possible that you may be someone who has you know like a, a tenuous understanding or relationship with their cultural background, but you are still that person. You are just on a journey of discovery, if you will, right? Well, I mean, I feel that as somebody who is like, so I came to Australia when I was three years old. So I've never really had a particularly strong connection to um, Maori culture as a result mm. of that displacement. But also, like, there there is a sense where I'm very, very pale. <laughs> so the response of people to me is never to identify me as Māori at all. And it would mm, not be mm. if I was in New Zealand as well, realistically, until I assert that identity. Yeah. And again, I mean, like, that's again due to colonial stereotypes. Yeah, right? absolutely. So for us, like, this has been something that we've been pushing against heavily because even now in popular culture, there's this idea of like, oh, you know, what percentage Māori are you? You know, it yes. doesn't. Yeah, and until recently, it was a common myth that there was no full-blooded Māori left, right? Mm, which doesn't mean anything 
under fuck a papa, right? No, not at all. Not, that, not only does it not, I mean, also it's not true. Yeah. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but it's, it's irrelevant. It's not actually part of the conversation. Um, and then we also, we had broader ideas of what family were, like what we call whānau translates to family, but it's much bigger than what Europeans think of as family. And it's broader in meaning. And that we also, we had a very common a thing called whāngai, which is like kind of adopting or fostering kids out, but very openly and stuff. It wasn't like a secret thing like what you see in the West. And if you were whāngai into a family, you'd get to keep your own whakapapa, but you'd also adopt theirs. Mm. So it was, you know, this... There's a bit more to it, right? It's a bit more of a malleable thing than just, well, my parent was... One parent was this, that parent was that, therefore I am, you know, like... Um, because, frankly, Blood Quantum is born out of racism. You know, oh, yeah. Colonial um, sort of scientific categorization where they wanted to think of us the same way they think of flora and fauna, right? Um, yeah, yeah. But yeah, but fuck a papa, though. Like, that's, and I think this is an important thing, right? This is something that we've had to fight against as a community um, is this idea of like, well, you're only half Māori, so therefore, yeah. are you really Māori, right? Which, again, that was the whole purpose of introducing that thinking in the first place is to dilute it and then therefore take away our claim to that heritage, therefore undermine that heritage's claim to the land, so on and so forth. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll rant about that for hours. <laughs> if you, if <laughs> oh, don't worry. Me. We'll get to it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that's basically fuck a papa. It's, it's effectively like... um. Your yeah, the the layers upon which you know make you up, and also I think it's important to realise that conceptually, we don't think of fuck papa as stopping with us. We don't think of ourselves as a destination, which is very yeah. common in the Western worldview. We think of ourselves as a part of a continuation of a story. So we actually believe everything has fuck papa, not just people. The land has fuck papa. Items have fuck papa. Everything around us has a fuck papa. The house you're in, the tree, the, the wood it's made out of came from a tree, which came from a ground in a certain place therefore it has fuck a papa and we think of ourselves as embedded in that overall world view you know all of this is sort of quite important in how we view these things uh and is in direct contradiction to you know like a um a blood quantum sort of race theory that um that you see in the west yeah there's also a a well a contradiction there between the the maori approach which sees us as part of the world and very much the European sort of humans have domination of and dominion over the environment they're in. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the ideologies of, of race and blood quantum and Faka Papa kind of directly inherit those sorts of ideas as well. Yeah, absolutely. Cause I mean, cause those ideas are born out of supremacy. Yeah. They were, they were born out of uh, an era where they used to use the racial groups to talk about people, the Caucasians, the Mongoloids, mm. you know, et cetera. And they had this idea that the Caucasian peoples were superior. Um, oh, and, yeah. and much like Homo sapien did to the Neanderthal, would ultimately inherit the world from them. Yes. And that was sort of, you know, like this is the dark side of the Enlightenment. Everyone talks about mm -hmm. the Enlightenment as this great thing, but that, that awakening. Yeah, it depends on whose side you're looking from, exactly, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, <laughs> Like it's a combination of the Enlightenment and the doctrine of discovery, uh, yeah. which you know ultimately sought to dehumanize others, and then over time you start sort of trying to yeah again dilute someone's cultural heritage and assimilate them through mm. this talk. Yeah, so blood blood quantum kind of directly feeds into the idea that you can assimilate native people by, uh, if you will, breeding it out of them. Yeah. Which I disagree with pretty fundamentally. Uh, yeah. So that leads us pretty directly into talking about the history and the politics of blood quantum. So blood quantum and the architecture of our current ideas about race really got started with the Enlightenment. So this was the merger of kind of scientific taxonomies and the idea of like natural history and the natural sciences with the hierarchical demands of empire and the power structures that empire required to perpetuate itself. As the various European empires expanded their colonies and started genociding native people, then as the transatlantic slave trade got going too, there's a pretty fundamental conflict between what the Enlightenment philosophers were saying about the rights, nobility, and equality of man, and the sorts of horrible things that these empires were subjecting millions of people to. 
they needed an ideological justification for those structures and an ideological way to reinforce them, which came in the form of structures of race identity and white supremacy, which said fundamentally, for one, that there are different races, particularly along the lines of skin color, and that these physical characteristics were linked to cognitive, cultural, and moral structures. Uh, We discussed that a bit more in our episode about eugenics, actually, for how that manifested into like the 19th and 20th centuries. Two, there is a hierarchy of races with the enlightened white Europeans at the top and everyone else at the bottom, although there were some group like Slavic people in the middle somewhere, and the boundaries of all these are flexible and political and depend on the needs of the circumstances of the time, as we shall see. Mm. Also, that as the superior race, it is uh, the benevolent duty of the Europeans to civilize the lesser races, either through colonization and assimilation for the races which were positioned as having that as a possibility, or to subjugate those who are basically just a lost cause due to their race through slavery. Race becomes a kind of biological destiny in this sense. And this is, as we'll see, quite radically different to the sorts of ideas that had come before this period. The Europeans were not the first to colonize other people, nor was the 18th century when this really got started the first time that they had noticed differences in population. I mean, we don't necessarily think about it too much, but the ancient world and, I mean, even like the 10th century or so were a lot more metropolitan than we necessarily think. Mm -hmm. For example, black people in Europe, they existed, they were known, Othello in the time of Shakespeare, was a Moor, and this was a racial construct that existed at the time. There is a 10th century copy of Beowulf featuring an illustration of the Ethiopian, which I had a lot of fun showing to the people who complained about Idris Elder as Heimdall in Thor, for example. (laughs) There are also, like, even within European cultures, sort of what what became racial identities could be seen in the identification of Jewish people, for Mm. example, who have been subjected to prejudice and discrimination for a very long time in Europe. But prior to, like, the the racialization of Jewishness in the 19th century, what it meant to be a Jew was more about culture and religion than it was a biological category that it became. So this is why the forms of Christian anti-Jewishness focused on conversion, rather than elimination, as it became under the Nazi party. Mm. What changed fundamentally was the the notion of hierarchy, the way that race became a political tool and, and was created as a political tool to identify groups and then to instantiate this sort of hierarchy and how that got tied into like racial animosity and hatred and things as part of this kind of material conditions of colonization. So colonization led to different systems of blood quantum for different political situations, depending on what the local legal structure used. Uh, In many ways, one of the kind of classic examples for this was most recognized in the US. So there, blood quantum for the First Nations people, the Native Americans, was used to minimize the number of Native American people in order to reject claims of native title, financial support, that sort of thing, because at some point there were these legal structures that gave access to that. In order to receive money from the state, you had to prove that you were full blood Native American for a long time. And then after that, that you had at least some level of First Nations ancestry. This gets made harder if you have things like displacement through the Trail of Tears, if you have forced child removal and other habits of genocide which break kinship ties. Basically, the quote unquote blood connection to Native peoples, it's minimized. Any dilution is considered to break the heritage because for settler colonial societies, it is advantageous to minimize the number of recognized natives. Exactly the same thing plays out elsewhere in the colonies, right? Mm -hmm. This plays into the idea that the native could be reformed through assimilation, whereas black people could not. In comparison, and this is where the the notion of a black race comes to play, in the US there were one-drop laws that these were used to maximize the number of slaves that were available during that era, where if you had one drop of black blood, one identifiable black ancestor, you were a slave from birth. 
there were some kind of interesting examples, if you will, horrific examples of how this played out, where like other Europeans coming to America into the American South during like Jim Crow era and things would see people who to them looked like white, they were pale skinned, fair hair, all this sort of thing, would still be segregated along with recognizably quote unquote black people Mm. because they had a single black ancestor and were known to have a single black ancestor. This is great for the slave owners because it means you don't get a generation of free people as a result of intermixing of races, right? I mean, this might be consensual, it might not. Frequently, it was not. But for the slave owners, you get more slaves from this instead mm. of free people who are the children of those uh, like situations. The ideological descendants of those ideas persist today in a lot of the forms of discrimination that are directed towards interracial relationships and mixed race people in the US. Part of the contemporary white supremacist ideology in the US sees black heritage as so powerful that a single black ancestor can quote unquote corrupt the genes of a person who would otherwise be considered white. This is why a lot of the ways that racial eugenics manifested in the US was very much about protecting the white race from contamination as they saw it by other other races. <sighs> it's, it's, it's heavy yeah. shit, eh? It's getting worse, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> Brazil is also a really interesting case study, which gets less attention in the West because the US is where we look to everything and dominates the literature. Brazil had a and still does, a staggering array of historical and current racial categories, mostly in reference to a kind of black-white gradation, with native people occasionally mentioned somewhere in the middle there on the basis of skin colour. I've heard it joked that you and anyone paler than you is white, anyone darker than you is black. (laughs) Brazil was a Portuguese rather than a British colony and got a completely undeserved reputation for being comparatively benign because the multitude of racial classifications reflected less emphasis on sexual segregation. And there was a process where slaves could be freed, unlike places like the US. This is a lie. In fact, I mean, I think that quibbling about the level of severity of racism is kind of a a bit of a misnomer. But if we look at it quantitatively, the conditions for slaves in Brazil were so brutal that the slave population never became self-supporting through having kids because they just died too fast. <sighs> yeah, it was real fucked. So the the kind of like material economics of it is that this served to prop up the Portuguese colonies in Angola, which were a rapacious exporter of slaves that had to be sent somewhere, as well as reducing the mechanisms for slaves to build solidarity and kinship that might support resistance. Slaves that survived and became free is part of this as well, because that disconnected the people who had been there for longer and might have been able to develop that kind of solidarity from the conditions which would best enable them to ferment rebellion. It was in fact a British blockade of all things that broke the slave system in Brazil because it stopped them importing slaves and because the you know, the the population had never been able to self-sustain, that actually killed the slavery system there. In terms of racial structure, the end of slavery brought to the fore in Brazil a demographic difficulty for the Portuguese colonizers. They were actually a minority there, unlike somewhere like the US, where you had a white majority and the slave population was kept comparatively small. Portugal didn't export very many people because it didn't have enough of a population at home to really do that. So the colonizers, the white European colonizers in Brazil were a minority. The black slaves were a majority. And one of the reasons that they were so concerned about slave uprisings, which did happen, is because they knew that they didn't have the population to overwhelm that. So the logic of racial division and racial hierarchy became a way to protect the ruling minority from the majority through sowing kind of division and internal conflict. This is where you get the me and everyone paler than me versus you and everyone darker than you sort of logic. Slave and free, born free versus granted freedom. Whether you were released from a slave ship the British blockade intercepted or you spent time in Brazil as a slave. Whether you were born to a parent who had been a slave. Plus, 
divisions between people who were African and those who were native and a whole lot bunch of regional shit as well leads to the immense spectrum of racial identity and was a tool for this maintenance of the hierarchy and maintenance of the white supremacy in that sort of a region. Mm. Liam, can you tell us about how blood quantum manifested in Aotearoa, and what are the current requirements for recognition of Māori, and how does it play into that? Oh, um, okay. <laughs> Sorry, <Yep. laughs> I was absorbing all that, that heavy shit. Yeah, it's a lot, right? <laughs> so um, here, uh, it really came about as a result of um, like post- Treaty of Waitangi, which was like our constitutional yeah. sort of document that, that founded the country. Uh, the Crown was snapping up land as quickly as it could. It was trying to, and it, and it effectively dispossessed us of 96% of the land. Yeah. Um, when we signed the treaty, we outnumbered Pākehā 10 to 1. Pākehā is the term we use for settlers. And within like 40 years, they outnumbered us. It was, it was very quick. Mm. But the issue they ran into is all of the laws... And your rights were determined by whether or not you could own land, right? Whether or not you owned land. Like you could only vote if you owned land, etc. And the issue they ran into is Māori didn't have an idea of individualistic land ownership. They were a communal people and they didn't own the land. They were just sort of, you know, guarding it, protecting it. Kaitiaki is the term we use. And they quickly realised that in order to get access to, to this resource or that one they they first used like these laws around land ownership giving you the right to vote etc as a way to disempower us because well if not one of you owns the land then you can't vote because <laughs> you know yeah and, like, and also if not one of you owns the land then that means it has to be available to just take yeah yeah so initially they got around this by like trying to find, you know, outsiders within various Māori communities to say, oh, yeah, I have the mana and rights to sell you this land, and then mm. would force us to cross the country to go to a land court and wait for months and months in unsanitary conditions to fight that sale, all the while they're surveying it and splitting it up and selling it on to other people, which we then have to take through dispute, right? So it was a system deliberately designed to disempower us. That, that was going on for quite some time, and then on top of that, you know, um, they were in the process of uh, missionary schools encouraging children to go away to be educated by Europeans, etc., and which we saw play out around the world. Now, all of this relates to blood quantum and that eventually Māori were like, oi, we signed this treaty and this treaty guaranteed us a say in our own governance. And so far, you're not giving that to us. So they, they said, okay, look, you know, we have this thing called a settler parliament, uh, and it was called that until the 70s. We have this thing called a settler parliament. And within that parliament, there's, you know, like 100 seats, whatever it was. We'll give you four, even though you're like half, yeah. half the population. We'll give you four. And in order to vote in those seats, you know, to be in, enrolled in the electorate for those seats, uh, you have to be a full-blooded Māori. <laughs> White yeah. people can't do it. And then eventually, soon after, they agreed to allow it for anyone who is half Māori or more. Um, and that was, again, it was a way to sort of try and disestab like to, to minimize disenfranchise yeah, yeah minimize our influence on the uh on, on parliament because we only had control of four seats and if you were um if you couldn't clearly establish your sort of your your mildiness in terms of blood quantum then you couldn't vote in them you had to go and vote in the white seats but then they'd turn around and say, well, hold on, do you own land? <laughs> and you'd, you'd probably say, well, no. I mean, I have land, but, I, you know, like... I don't own it's it. It's not yeah. mine, you know. Um, so there was this whole process to try and stop us having access to power and voting. And that lasted until the 70s, that, that particular law. And then, like, there's also the cultural idea as well, outside of the legal idea, the legal system around that blood quantum. There was the cultural idea of... There was this really like sort of quote unquote romantic notion within the more progressive colonizers uh, in the late sort of 19th century that felt that we were a dying race and um, <laughs> yes. that they were trying to like they wanted save. to save us yeah. and help us and or at least make sure that our memory is carried on. <laughs> <laughs> uh, really well <laughs> through through their structures, of course. Yeah, not through literally, our own. yeah, through stories written by them and artwork done by them, etc. Um, and they were like sort of out trying to catalogue us while we still existed. 
And um, <laughs> yes, so like that was often like a lot of talking around, you know, this sort of depleting idea of Māori blood. Yeah, the idea that it was being diluted. Yeah, and that that carried on for a very long time, like a very very long time, and 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 there's still degrees of that today. So the seventies roll around. And then we turn around and said, oi, yeah, like we had a lot of stuff happened for Māori in the 70s. That's when our language got officially recognised as a language in New Zealand. It was New Zealand's first official language uh, recognised as such legally. That was when, you know, we, we changed the way the Māori electorates worked. So at that point, if you claimed to be Māori, then you were Māori. And, and that mm. took a lot of fighting for us to get there. And there was lots of talk about how, oh, well, this will ultimately mean that, you know, Pākehā will just come in and say they're Māori to try and overwhelm the votes and stuff. But no, of course not, because when you're a supremacist, the last thing you want to do is identify yeah, as... Yeah, identify with the sort of people, yeah. <laughs> so, like, there was all this talk around that. And then, and then for a while, they were saying, well, look, now that we're where we are, we can just get rid of these racist seats. And we said, no, we want them, because it's the only way that we can make sure our voice isn't lost in yours. Yeah. We've fought to empower them since then. And there's still this idea of, like, every time in a comes up every three years there's one next year there's always this big hoo-ha about the Māori seats and because mm. they're based on our population and our population is growing whilst native like well, not native uh uh new zealand born europeans pakia mm. is uh, diminishing so there's a lot of concern there that our, our seats are growing we're up to six seats it's looking very likely that we're going to end up having seven mm. soon um and that's a problem because there's only 120 of them and, yeah. <laughs> and if, they, if they have too many they might be they might get to 10 percent. and when that happens oh we can't have that <laughs> so it's um yeah it's it's this interesting sort of idea that we have now when it comes to claiming your maori on a census or whatever anyone can tick the box and claim that they're maori and then they're asked to enter in their iwi or their tribe now individual tribes have different ways of tracking whether or not you claim fuck a papa back to them right so yeah. i recently applied for membership to my tribe now membership isn't required to claim to be a member of the tribe for the sake of the census or whatever. But in order for me to be a card-carrying member of Ngāti Kahanunu, um, I had to... Which is a very funny idea in its own right, really. Yeah, yeah. It comes with a whole host of benefits, though, so I'm looking forward to it. But um, <laughs> but uh, I, I had to, like, list out my whakapapa and, you know, back to not just my whakapapa in terms of my genealogy, going back four generations as much as I could, you know, um, I had to also link myself back to a marae, which is like a meeting house, which would have been the centre of our traditional community, and other bits and pieces like that. Like I had to basically talk the talk, you know. Yes. And then provide somebody who is a member of the tribe who's respected. A card-carrying member of yeah, the tribe, I assume. Yeah. Who could vouch for me. So, you know, that, that requires having a bit of knowing a bit of stuff, right? And obviously a lot of our people don't. So yes. it's a, actual like official tribe membership in terms of like card carrying members is quite low. So we're quite realistic about it, right? Like um, we typically just ask people, you know, what's your, what's your iwi? What's your whakapapa? Who are you? Tell, mm. and, and can you tell us? Because we have this thing called a pepeha, which is like our traditional introduction mm. and when we meet someone we give our pepeha and in that we start with our mountain that we come from because mountains are very important in our culture and we go from there through our various landmarks to the people that we come from and then the places that we come from and so on and so forth learning one's pepeha is often the first thing they do when they go on their sort of cultural awakening right mm. and that typically involves having to learn a bit of whakapapa if you can rattle off a pepeha there's a very good that, that states you are of, of a people. There's a very good chance you are. Now it may come down to it at some point that someone you might want to go and actually talk to your people at your marae and they they actually because they can. Uh, there's people based solely off our verbal records who can go back seven generations. Yeah. So if you go to one of these people and you tell them who you are from, who your parents were, etc., it's very likely they can figure out quite quickly whether or not you're from that Madai. Mm. That's, that's like a, an important role within our society is having people who know this information. And 
it's it's funny because the whole 23andMe and Ancestry.com and stuff is actually, whilst it's quite sort of despicable in the whole selling people your percentage of race, yeah, because they notify relatives when they pop mm. up, we are rapidly building up the sort of database we have of our members as people do these things. There's an interesting conflict that we'll get to between the kind of positioning of these companies as, if you will, data companies within a capitalist system, mm. and the quite real and very useful desire of Native peoples to make those connections, even if they don't necessarily know whose parentage is, is in place. So we will get to that, don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like recently, quite like in the last few years, so the, so it become this thing when I was a kid I, I used to always get asked what percentage Māori are you right up until mm. like 15 years ago like even 10 years ago I think it's the last time I genuinely got asked that question by somebody who didn't realise what they were doing was actually quite horrible yes because you know a lot of people are ignorant around this stuff right it's just, yeah. it was normal so about 10 years ago I, I had that question asked of me and then, interestingly in that same conversation was when I also heard a very common white supremacist myth that was, oh, and look, there's no full-blooded Māori left anyway. Uh, you know? Yeah. Which I was like, well, that's, that, no, hold on, that's not true. Like, where I grew up, you can go up into the hills there and there's people there who never learnt to speak English. Like, trust mm. me. Like, <laughs> there are, trust me, they, <laughs> that, that, that is not true. People just didn't want to believe it until a few years ago a Māori newscaster happened to do one of those tests for a TV show they were doing, and they come back saying they're 100% Māori. And then funnily, immediately, everyone started questioning the authenticity and the, <laughs> and the accuracy of these tests, right? Yeah. Because, well, no, that's not true. Yeah. Right? <laughs> that can't be true. Yes. Um, but it, it challenged this idea immediately <laughs> that, like, well, I mean, we've been telling you the whole time, if you had to just listen to us, like, you know, we're not this dying race in need of saving. Like, you, our culture is in need of saving and revitalising but we're good we don't need your help you know and you can stay out of it <laughs> basically <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, this idea in culture of us being mixed up or whatever or like every time because you know obviously land rights are a big deal we still only own about six or seven percent of the land in, in Aotearoa New Zealand mm. and a lot of that land was stolen and there's a process we're going through uh, through something called the Treaty Tribunal, uh, which is addressing these historical thefts and stuff in a very minimalistic way. We we settle on average for about 3% of the value of what was taken from us. Mm. But it's still a, a process we go through. The Crown apologises, etc., you know, and um, we do this whole big thing. And every time one of these big settlements come up where a big tribe has gone through it and, you know, it's announced that they're going to get X hundred million dollars or whatever, Pākehā in New Zealand gets up in arms because they feel like we're somehow privileged over them. It's a big thing at the moment because co-governance is on the ballot at the moment. Mm. So the treaty says that we are supposed to be equal participants in the running of this country. That's 50% of the fucking government power. We don't have close to that, mm. but we are starting to get control over our own outcomes and mm. slowly at such a snail's pace. Uh, and that's too much. We can't have that. Why do they get their own funding for their people? Isn't that apartheid? Like, this is the sort of conversations that are happening in this country right now. Yeah. And inevitably, inevitably, blood quantum comes up. Like, well, mm. not all of them are even, you know, what's to stop someone claiming their Māori just to get the scholarship from the tribe and go to school? And why do they get to have it just because their grandmother happened to be a bit brown? Right, like, that's the sort of conversation that happens yeah. here. yeah. Uh, so in our culture, it's still a very prominent idea, um, although it's a bit more sort of like, I mean, even there's a prominent political party in New Zealand, one of the minor parties, they're currently the party trying to push for the removal of these co-governance rights that are coming our way. Oh, right. Every time you tell, tell them that that's racist, their co-leader loves to point out that, well, actually, no, hold on. I am Tainui. I am Māori because, you know, I fuck up up a Māori, which is true, but the guy's not living it at all. Yeah. Right? He's he's actively, like, he's just using that as a shield, right? Mm. So it's, like, it's convenient for him. But then he goes, and as a Māori, I don't think I need this. I think it's actually offensive that you think I need special treatment to get equality, da 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 <laughs> yeah. like, So it's, like, it, it can be quite sort of, He's like weaponizing the concept of fucker papa. Well, there's also like the use of racial division in order to like amplify a class struggle, right? Or to or to divide 
people who are mm. disadvantaged along different lines in order to kind of reinforce existing hierarchies is a, is a well-trodden sort of path. The, the notion of solidarity and, and the recognition of, of struggle that other people have and shared struggle against hierarchy itself, against disadvantage and like material conditions and these things and, and like labor relations is undermined so much when race and race structures and blood quantum is used to divide the mm. people who would otherwise take part in those struggles. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, we're seeing that now, you know, like, you know, the, you know, a lot of the dialogue that's happening here is, well, hold on, don't white people struggle too? Why do Māori get extra stuff? It's like, well, because we're 15% of the population, but we're 53% of the prison population, right? Yes. Like, clearly, the system as it is right now isn't working for us, nor has it ever. So let's maybe look at how, you know, like remove that racial disparity and people don't want to have that conversation. <laughs> That's why I well, talk about how there's no more true-blooded Māori. So really, is this a racial issue? Because none of you are pure Māori, you know, like that sort of mm, bollock. Mm. Well, it, it is not exclusively a racial issue, but it is a racial issue. And that mm. that is something that needs to, like, the racial aspect of this cannot be set aside. Yeah which is what they're trying to do, really. And, of course, I feel like the same people who are making those arguments who I'm guessing are not actually the working poor white people. Oh, no. Yeah, no. yeah, of course not, <laughs> right? They're not interested in helping the working poor white people. They're just interested no. in reducing the ability of another group to uh, overcome the, that sort of division. Yeah. Well, often it's used to divide the working poor. Yeah, exactly. Right? So a lot of poor Pākehā have more in common with poor Māori than they do the people who are spreading these ideas. Yeah. But because these ideas are spread, you see that division. You see the same thing with sort of, you know, um, poor Republican sort of followers, white Republicans yes. in America and poor, you know, black communities, et cetera. Um, it's commonly used as a, as a divisive tactic. I think the line was, if you can convince the poor white person that he is still better than any black person in the US, he will revote for you forever, right? Yeah, yeah. But in here, like... It's interesting. See, back when in the 90s, when I was growing up, a scientist come out talking about how Māori have a warrior gene. Ooh, and yes. what he what he <laughs> spoke about that was he looked at, I'm sort of diverging a wee bit from, from blood quantum here, but I'll get back to it. So back when the English tried to come here and, and colonise the country, for a while there they tried doing it by force. That didn't really work out for them so well because we gave them a pretty good scrap. And eventually they realised it was not economic to keep fighting us because we were sort of giving them too much of a run for their money. So they went from the this idea of like the impoverished savage to the noble warrior race yes. trope. And they and they and their history talked a lot about how we were great warriors and we were very good at being great warriors, etc. And, and, and they made a big deal about how our history was bloody and full of bloodshed and also made up lies about us wiping out a, a race that was here before us that never actually existed. But we won't go into that today. They, they, they made us out to be these great warriors. And then fast forward to the you know, 90s, uh, they go back and they look at the number of us in prison, the number of us in gangs, the statistics around family violence, etc. that weren't in our favour due to, you know, Turns out that, you know, having really shit material conditions of being subject to colonisation does that to people. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, but he pointed as that as proof, or clearly they've got this warrior gene. These <laughs> are an angry, violent warrior people, and, and they're not suited for the constraints of civil society. That idea took off. People were all over that for about 10 years. And again, there was this idea of like, well, you know, as, as you guys breed it out of yours and you integrate a bit more, maybe it's not going to be such a big problem. Well, am I am I right in thinking that there are some, like, among the Māori supremacists who still lean on that idea of kind of a warrior culture because it's about, like, the power and the violence rather than anything else? When you say Māori supremacists, what... what uh, uh, yeah, what's... so um, I have encountered some Māori people writing about Maori race being supreme in the sense of more powerful, biologically better than other races, and they do lean on this idea of a warrior gene and a warrior society and mm. things like that. I think um, that's a couple of things. One, that's because they've bought the colonial lie. Right? Yeah. Two, I think it's um, 
it's trying to reject this idea that we are a, a, a weak people who are deserving of yeah, what happens. Yeah, and, and, subge- and subject to the white yeah. supremacy, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think it's really just a reaction from people who who don't really know better. Mm. Um, and often it's because, again, like we're not taught our own history in schools still. We learn all about World War Two, and we learn about, you know, Shakespeare and shit, but we don't learn about our history unless you go to a specifically Māori school and stuff. So mm. we're sort of... We even now because because it was an oral culture, we go back and look at our own history, and what we're really reading is ethnographers writing down stuff that they got talking to us through translators. So yeah. like our recovery of our culture and our history is really shoddy, and then people just sort of fall into this sort of this this trap, right? Mm. Um, which is a shame, uh, and it's something that we still see a bit of, you know, um, a fair bit, like. <laughs> Because it's like one of the things we were allowed to be proud of for so long was our martial prowess. Yes. And one of, one of the few things we were taught about our history was our martial prowess. But we know, like, and even in, like, there's a movie called Once We're Warriors, which is all about this, you know, horrible sort of way that contemporary Māori live in, in cities and stuff like that. Mm. And it was like, yeah, once upon a time, you guys were noble warriors, and now look at you sort of vibe. And it's like, well, you know, Moana Jackson actually did a speech about it. He passed away earlier this year, mm. but he was a prominent advocate for, for our rights. And he did a speech called Once We're Gardeners. And yes. he says it's just, it was like, it's a shame that, you know, we were labelled Once We're Warriors. And if, if we were true about our history, we're Once We're Gardeners, Once We're Navigators, once we're astrologers, you know, um, and if you're Kahanuni, once we're lovers, right? Which we're, quite, <laughs> we're quite famous for that. I won't go into that for the sake of our listeners. Uh, <laughs> years. But, um, but you know, like it's um, we've got this 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 really rich, diverse history that we were just never taught because mm. it made General Cameron look like less of an incompetent leader and less of a coward for not wanting to fight us if they made us out to be big and scary. <laughs> yes, like that's ultimately you know, where in, in reality the general. Actually Actually, was a very competent general who realised, well, we probably shouldn't be fighting this war because one, we're not very good at it, and two, it's not working. There's better ways to do it. But yeah. back in England, they didn't like that, mm. so they went on about how scary we were and how how he didn't um, he couldn't handle us. So and then that led to this idea of a savage warrior race, um, which we see we saw the same thing in South America. Mm. Anywhere you want to dehumanise the people, you go on about a savage warrior race and then you take their stuff off them. And then eventually, once you've gotten off fighting them violently, you then start saying, well, look, some of you are still here, but you've kind of intermingled with us, so are you that really? And that's when we get back to this. Yeah. And then it gets really messy once you start tying laws to blood quantum and stuff as well, which we see time and time again. I think there's also this idea that ultimately, given enough time, bloodlines will continue to intermingle because that's what humans do. And if we define one's access to these things by their blood quantum, their, their percentage, then given time, these concessions we make today will no longer have to be made, right? So it's like, oh, yes, no, we did all this stuff to you, but it's okay because we're going to give you some special funding for your people since we stole all your land, and, and here it is. But to claim it, you have to be X amount. Yeah. And then they think, right, so give that five generations, <laughs> yeah. and we don't have to pay that money anymore, right? Yeah. It's like This is a hundred-year-long sort of thing that we work, a plan here, you know, like, which... Unfortunately, that's just not how human cultures work. Mm. We'll, st- we, we'll still be here. People said we were dying 130, 40 years ago. We're still here. <laughs> so, like, we're going to be here in 100 times, you know, 100 years from now as well. Yeah. But if you try and you know, hang your hat on this idea of blood quantum, well, we won't be here anymore because. Yeah, well, less or less of us will be because we've intermingled and intermarried as, as New Zealand's become more of a cosmopolitan landscape, right? Yeah, and, and like Farka Papa is in such direct contradiction to that because mm. arguably that intermingling will increase the number of Māori every yeah. generation, which yeah. of course is a huge threat to the white supremacist organisation. We love it. Yes. <laughs> we love it. Yeah, for sure. Like, um, yeah, 100%. You know, like, that's another issue, right, is they don't want people to sort of 
claim that because they gain that challenges the the fragile sort of especially right like yeah, you might end up cutting this gonna go right off the rails here I'll for go a bit. For it. What, when you realize that colonization and imperialism is ultimately a form of advanced capitalism right yes and when you think about the maori worldview around kaitiaki like we don't own the land we don't own resources we use them with permission from the land and it's our job to maintain it and protect it then that is directly in contrast with extraction-based economies, which is the primary economic model we see in most parts of the world today. So within capitalism, it's all about extracting every last ounce of resource you can out of the world around you. I mean, Australia is great. Look at all the mines, mm. right? It's all about just sort of like exploiting the resources you have to their utmost and you have to keep getting more and more efficient at that every year because GDP must go up. It cannot stop. The idea of whakapapa enabling people to claim maori and then maybe enabling them to accept a te ao Māori worldview then is a direct challenge to this extractive model of capitalism because as more and more people start thinking, well, hold on, we don't own this world, we can't really just profit off of it, then that starts challenging the grip that the sort of the 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 owner class has right over our country uh and that is scary they don't want that neoliberalism doesn't want that capitalism doesn't want that to me as like a, a, an avowed socialist if you will but more broadly a leftist and and like somebody who is tangentially doing climate related research for example yep. i see this as a necessity more than anything else. I mean, you, yeah. you can build like class Same. solidarity <laughs> across cultures, right? But to push back against the extraction and the overuse of natural resources and things and to say that actually we need to give space for the world to heal from, mm. you know, centuries of exploitation and centuries of like carbon use and things like that, to bring the the claims of Faka Papa and to expand Maori culture across more of the New Zealand population is extremely powerful and extremely useful to that broad project of saying, no, we really have to fucking deal with this because climate yeah, change yeah. is going to be a huge threat. Oh, yeah, I mean, I'm, like, exactly, 100%. Like, 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 a lot of climate activists, especially within the Maori world, are saying, hold on, this idea, like, te ao Maori, the Maori worldview, even if you're not one of us and you don't have papa back through our stuff, if you adopted that as the way you looked at the world, we would be able to tackle this climate issue quite quickly. Yes. Because once you start thinking, well, hold on, they have this saying in the Waikato, because you've got the Waikato River, where I am the river, the river is me, right? Like, like that's... And there, and and then the concept of fuck papa and te ao Māori, mountains catch the the rain that come out of the sky, and they form rivers that ultimately pass through the land to go out to sea. And we look at those rivers as umbilical cords that connect us to the landscape because we always settle around you know, sources of water naturally. You know, once you start thinking of the world that way, that that's not just river. That is your connection to the world, right? That mountain isn't just a rock. Like, that's an ancestor who is catching the rain and helping fill that river that you, your people use to survive and sustain themselves. You know, we're the ones out there protesting deep she drilling. We're the ones out there doing all this stuff. We're the ones who are trying to reforest the country. We're the ones fighting introduced predators and stuff like that. Because we see ourselves as related to the land. We see ourselves as related to, you know, the, the animals and the birds, etc. that are here. And when they get damaged and they die, it's like watching a loved one go. Mm. Now that's as far away as you can get from, oh yeah, no, so my mother was mostly Māori, my dad's English, so I guess I'm kind of a third, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. It's about as far away from that as you can get. But it's, like, so important to how we interact with the world and I think is going to be more and more important in the future, especially once you start thinking about Papa as not just the layers that are behind you but the layers that are in front of you. Our yeah. time today is borrowed from our future generations and our future generations are the most important thing to us. Fucker Papa is all about nurturing the new roots in the middle of the, the fern, right? So we need to think, right? Like like 
my ancestors didn't cross the Pacific a thousand years ago just for us to fuck it up today. We need to think about <laughs> yes. about the next generation. And that's really, really important to our worldview. We don't care if that person is only, you know, Ten percent or whatever. Yeah, yeah. Six, one sixty fourth Māori. If if they if they can rattle off their fuck papa, if they can do their pepper, uh, chuck out a good poo and you know as long as they turn up at the madai and do the bloody dishes, we're happy. <laughs> You're one of us. Well, good on you. Well, also, so long as they take on board that stewardship of the the world around them as well, hmm. in order to protect the person after them. Yeah, but also like I mean, fuck papa, right? If you think about our like I. If we're honest, like we can trace our fucker papa back to like Taiwan, right? You can go, mm. you can go back to Taiwan, and there's carved houses there, um, and the, the indigenous people of Taiwan, their language has some passing similarities to ours. And then as you make your way through the Pacific, through Polynesia, that that resemblance gets more and more closer to the point where Rata Tonga and us we sp- effectively speak the same language. Yeah, but because of that, right? So I talk about my tupuna, Tamatia Arakanui. And Ruafaro, those two crossed and came to New Zealand on a Takatimi Walker about eight, nine hundred years ago. Now, they weren't Māori because they weren't born here, but they're still our tupu now. They're still part of our whakapapa, so they are Māori, right? You know what I mean? It, it gets, yeah. but if you were to go by blood quantum, well, hold on, our earliest ancestor was actually a Cook Islander or maybe even Tahitian. So then none of us are Māori, you know what I mean? Like, like it doesn't, no, that's not how this works. <laughs> well, I think this is one of the kind of the lies at the heart of, of blood quantum and the idea that these kind of geographically distinct people emerge, right, is that you go far enough back, we are all yeah. African by that logic. 100%. But of yeah. course, <laughs> like, that doesn't play into the white supremacist construction of these things. Yeah. So they don't use it. It's interesting, right? So if you were to say I was fifty percent Māori, Māori just means normal in our language. Yes. So like, <laughs> I am well as somebody who is deeply abnormal along any sort of gradient. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, what I'm saying is like we didn't yeah, we yeah. didn't have a concept for race. We were just like yeah. we were asked, well, what are you? I don't know. This is just a bloke. Who are you? <laughs> well, an Englishman. Okay, that's cool. I don't know what that is. <laughs> you know, like so it's this idea of of like establishing these differences is, is foreign to us to begin with. It's only become important as we've had to live in this this bicultural society that's rapidly turning into a, into a, like a um, a bigger sort of cosmopolitan one. But um, yeah, yeah, it's yeah, it's I don't know. I I I, I, I every, any whenever I hear people talk about blood percentages today, you kind of it means one of two things, right? One of them they're either ignorant and you hope that's the case because the other one means that they're racist, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Um so it's yeah. always scary to hear when you hear that stuff. So I find it really interesting to trace the kind of sibling, if you will, relationship between Australia and New Zealand in that respect because when like Maori were granted voting rights in New Zealand, there was actually transfer across the ditch because in Australia there were laws on the books prior to universal voting rights which explicitly extended the right to vote to Maori people in Australia who owned land mm. but excluded Indigenous Australians as part of kind of the effort to divide and conquer the two. And in Australia, Maori people who were brought over here were immediately told that, oh, you're better to these like better than these Aboriginal people because you are this warrior race and all this sort of thing. Whereas these like local indigenous people who had much of the similar sort of experience of colonization were deliberately positioned as being separate in order to make sure that there was not a kind of cross Tasman solidarity between colonized people being built. Yeah. I mean that happened all around the empire, right? Oh yeah. If you go back and so like uh Gandhi, right? Mm. You go back and read some of the stuff he wrote when he was before he in South Africa, when he was in South yeah. Africa, and he was talking about how horrible it was that Indian people were being t- treated as bad as the local blacks, black people, yeah. And that was because he had been taught this idea of racial sort of um, hierarchies, and then you know, so thankfully, I guess he 
got the view from that to like, oh, I'm going to have to go back and help our people get away from this empire. Yeah. But yeah, unfortunately, the views were there, right? I mean, yeah, and he wasn't exactly uh, in favor of black emancipation in South Africa when he was there either, unfortunately. Yeah. 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 And again, like, I mean, yeah, and I think, you know, this, some of this stuff comes back to our fear of the other. But some yeah. of it's also around people trying to maintain status and dignity in yeah. the face of indignity, right? Like it's really, again, going back to your comments earlier about some sort of Māori supremacists and stuff, it's yeah, really absolutely. easy to feel disempowered and look for any way you can to empower yourself, um, yes. which is a shame because if we actually step back and look at the bigger picture, you know, like 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 the the system wants us <laughs> to, yeah. to to be at well, each other. We just need to stop that. This is why I feel like solidarity is kind of the antidote to that in so many ways. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I do want to talk a bit more about the the Australian context as well yeah. because here Australia had state legislation which was explicit grounds for the state forcibly taking children from Indigenous families in what became the Stolen Generations. So in 1886, the first of these laws were passed in Victoria and Western Australia, and they were called the Half-Caste Act, which half-caste meant half-Aboriginal or Indigenous, half-white, basically. And this became the basis of legislation in Queensland, New South Wales, and South Australia for the subsequent generations. So the logic was that mixed race Indigenous people should be taken from their Indigenous families because, for one, they were biologically distinct from, quote, full-blooded Indigenous people as a result of being you know, mixed, and they could be integrated into the colonial society as domestic servants, so there's a material incentive there to get your domestic workforce, and be discouraged in that context from having kids with other indigenous people in order to breed it out of them. So this, mm. exactly the same sort of like story is about the indigenous people being di a dying race, as opposed to like, different nations of people all across anyway that's a, that's another discussion right mm. so these laws stayed on the books in australia in some states until the 70s yeah. and forced child removal still happens at a much greater rate for indigenous people compared to the general population same here in yeah. no small part because the like poverty and inherited poverty that comes from being colonized means that these people have generally poorer lives because the government isn't willing to give them any money to let them live out of poverty. I was reading a thing the other day. It was one of the writings of um, Moana Jackson. And he was talking about doing a survey of 600 prisoners, mm. uh, Indigenous prisoners, and asking them a bunch of questions. One of the things that very quickly came up was that of the 600 prisoners, only 53 of them had parents who owned their own homes. Yeah. Right. So it was like, you know, forcing people to be, uh, you know, to not own land, to not own intergenerational wealth. It was the quickest way to ensure that they were downtrodden in and out of the system, have their kids taken off them. Like, you know, because again, we're 15% of the population, we're 53% of Māori males are in prison, 61% of Māori. Of, of of the female pr prison population in New Zealand is in, is uh, is Māori, uh, to to make them actually the largest single racial or cultural group that's imprisoned, I think, in the world, is my understanding. Yeah, so Australia has similar statistics around Indigenous people in prison because it's the same playbook, yeah. right? Like, and again, like you know, full disclosure, I work in social housing, right? And social housing is ultimately set up seemingly to kindly offer homes to the people who need them the most, but they ultimately end up full of um, you know, Indigenous people and other minorities who are, are in often substandard housing, paying uh, you know, sort of rent to the Crown. They disenfranchise them of their land in the first place. And because they're paying this rent and stuff and the, the housing market in this part of the world, and I know it's the same in Australia, mm. is so hot and toxic, they're never going to get into it. And on top of that, it's disenfranchised them from their traditional connections to the land. It's often moved them to different parts, like urbanised them. Yeah. So you're keeping a cheap workforce in the city, should you need it, and you're stopping them getting back on their own two feet. So there's an interesting history there uh, in the United States, actually, after emancipation, which was that because the freed slaves 
were not given any compensation for their stolen labor. In fact, the often the white slaveholders were given compensation. This is a pattern you see across the world. All of a sudden, you have this massive black underclass yeah. who can then be like made into convicts relatively easily because you criminalize poverty, you force them into all kinds of desperate situations where they have to commit crime in order to survive, and then you pack them off to prisons and things. And this is how you get the form of legal slavery in the US, which is enforced labor for prisoners. Yep. There was a carve out in the um, amendment to the constitution, which abolished slavery, which said, oh, you can still do it if they're prisoners. That has reinforced the kind of racial hierarchies and the racial structure of power in the US because, well, the slave owners needed a replacement for their emancipated slaves, so we'll just get the prisoners to do it. Yeah, 100%. Interesting. <laughs> like, because again, like, you know, there's that need for capital needs a workforce that it can readily exploit. Yeah. That, that's it. Yeah. And if there's already a, an, a like a, a group that is justifiably to be, to be exploited in the eyes of the majority of the, mm. of the majority of, of the country, then, you know, like a minority is always going to fill that niche. <laughs> so here you in know? Australia that um, we didn't have transatlantic slaves brought over from Africa, but there was slavery of people from Pacific islands. So I, mm. the term was blackbirding, which was basically that you kidnapped people or otherwise like forced them into some sort of indentured servitude on sugar plantations and Queensland and things like that. Mm. And now descended from that is that an awful lot of our agriculture here is done with uh, migrant lab laborers in varying states of emancipation, let's say, in the sense that they may or may not be here within the confines of the law, their treatment is pretty shit. Their working conditions are generally shit as well. Sorry, and I should add an addendum to that in that even if they are here legally, they may be going through companies that basically put them into a position of owing a debt to the company that they work off by working on farms and things like mm. that, which is realistically a kind of indentured servitude in a way. Yeah. So all of these sorts of structures carry on through time and are so deeply intertwined with the sorts of capitalist extraction stuff that founded them in the first place. It's just yeah. that who gets subjected to that changes with time and place in many ways. Yeah. Same here. During the COVID lockdowns, there was um, all the agriculture industry was up in arms over how they didn't have access to their cheap migrant workforce. Oh my god, yes, exactly the same here. But, They're like, yeah. oh my god, Australians won't work in these conditions. What are we going to do? Yeah, change like the fucking conditions. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, that's, like, this is the <laughs> thing. Like, <laughs> these, these, yeah, yeah. these free market sort of capitalist types keep going on about how important it is that people go out there and earn a dollar, but then they won't make them want to. Like, so clearly the market is speaking. Like, yes. <laughs> like, oh my god. <laughs> if, if you require, if you require everything to be broken. And, 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 and exploitation to exist for your business to profit, then it's not a successful fucking business. Isn't it funny how capitalism claims to operate a free market wherein the worker can bargain for the value of their labor, but anytime you get to the point where the worker says, actually, my labor is worth more than this, oh, no, 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 we have to have something changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, nah, like it's, I find it very interesting seeing that play out every time and government gets the blame because they haven't like it's happening right now with yeah, the, yeah. the financial crisis we're having at the moment it's like oh well you know like we're having to let crops rot on the trees because we can't find workers and it's like well how much are you paying them? <laughs> yeah okay um, i'm yeah. going to haul us back i'm afraid because <laughs> like we've, we've been going for like an hour and 20 minutes at this point <laughs> Yeah. And I, I have some more material to get through, I promise, which is Sorry. I want to... Look, I'm somewhat verbose. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, for one thing, you got me talking about capitalism, which was always going to happen and then always get centered by about half an hour. But also, I really, really want to talk about these genealogy companies. So mm -hmm. the way that blood quantum kind of manifests these days is less in the laws around... Well, I mean, outside of particular circumstances, like uh, the laws around being like Maori and things... It's less that it still shows up in the, the genealogical data analysis stuff thing. So this is your 23andMe, Ancestry.com, and similar. Mm. So these kind of fall into a blood quantum trap when they give you percentage ancestry descriptions. So let's say something like, oh, you're 80% English and 10% Dutch and all that sort of stuff. 
I'd like to talk a bit about the statistical issues with these numbers, even beyond the political ones. But first, I'm going to say that it is my professional opinion that no one should send their DNA to these companies because they do not treat your data as actually private and confidential. You yeah, know. <laughs> right? And even if they did, you don't really have any guarantee that these data sets would stay secure. There are, for example, cases where the police have used these databases to identify people whose DNA is present at a crime scene through their relatives who have submitted their DNA to these yeah. companies. And like evidence of somebody's DNA being present is not always treated as the circumstantial information that it typically is in court. So your DNA being at the site of a crime... Outside of like very special circumstances, that doesn't mean a hell of a lot. It means your DNA is there. It doesn't even necessarily mean that you were there. There's also a lot of groups subjected to state violence on the grounds of race who can reasonably expect to be targeted if their information falls into state hands. For example, there's precedent of this with the Holocaust, thanks to IBM's work with the Nazis using population census data. And there are increasingly racist authoritarian groups in Europe who are more than happy to target Roma people, for example, to repeat that sort of shit there. Hmm. Now for the methodological complaints. So the way that these tests work is that they have a database of gene sequences tagged with location, and they calculate similarity metrics for a new sample to the existing database. The typical term for this is your admixture, if you will. The more curated databases for ethnicity tend to get samples from people who can trace their ancestry a long way in a given location, so they are less subjected to migration mixing. And in fact, some of these co companies will claim to be able to connect people back to pre-colonization populations as well, because <laughs> that mixed things up a little. Hmm. So what the measurement of similarity looks like is that you test for the presence of markers, sequences of DNA at particular positions on particular chromosomes, which you know vary between populations in your existing database sample. So let's imagine that we have our new person here, and we have some existing people in the database. Let's call them people A and B. We're going to look at a few se segments of the DNA so this segment here, this segment here, and this one here. Sorry to the people who are doing audio only, but I'm drawing three segments on some lines. It's very artistic. <laughs> Thank you. I do my best. It's also why having the video is so really useful to explain this sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's say that this person A has sequences A, B, and C on theirs. This person B has sequences A, D and E. So we've got this common one on this first and then two different ones on the second and third. This new person has sequences A, B and F. So this new person shares one sequence with person B and two sequences with person A. So you can say that they are more similar to person A than they are to person B. You can ex expand this out to a whole bunch of different sequences. You can also say maybe sequences F and C are similar in some part, like the first bit, but have differences along the line. And there's a whole bunch more complexity that I do not understand because I've never done genetics. But this is the basic idea, right? You get metrics of similarity between different example sequences and whoever you're bringing in to look at. So that gives you a measure of how close or distant your genes are, which is then projected out to be a measure of how close or distant a relation you are to these people. And usually you'll have like some number of samples from a given geographic area. And that's how you say you are this percentage English, is you say you have this strength of a similarity in your genome to these people that we've sampled from England. Mm. Okay, you can also get information linking you to other people who have done the tests within like you, the same population. So if I do the test and my brother does the test and we don't know that we're siblings, that will show up. And this is one of the ways that it has been used by native people to kind of extend identifying who is within a particular family or a particular tribe. Hmm. You can get an estimate of how many steps you are removed. So me and my brother, we have a shared parent, so that's considered one step. Myself and a cousin have a shared grandparent, so that would be two steps, right? 
I'm not sure what you do for half siblings. I mean, you can probably do like a 1.5 or something like that, but you can measure this sort of relational distance. There are additional details that can trace your matrilineal relationships. So there's a specific form of DNA in one part of the cell called the mitochondria. You only inherit that through the egg. You don't get it through the sperm. So that traces this kind of maternal line. If you have somebody with a Y chromosome, you can also trace patrilineal relationships through like the father's line, the inheritance of that Y chromosome. This is complicated somewhat by some forms of intersex physiology, but that's like because intersex physiology is not very well understood, for example, intersex genetics not necessarily very well understood, that isn't necessarily brought into the discussion, particularly for what these companies are doing. When it comes to your fundamental genealogical testing, the problems are kind of twofold. How good is your existing database of representing populations in a particular area? And how well does DNA similarity translate to kinship relationships? So in the first case, this is basically a sampling problem. How good is your genealogical database at representing a particular population? Many of them are biased to have much more sample density in Northern Europe. So mm. 23 and Me, for example, very good, supposedly, within Northern Europe pretty shit anywhere else. A lot of equatorial areas and much of the African continent in particular have very bad representation in a lot of these sort of genealogy companies. If there is nothing in the database for a given area, you can't detect that someone is related to the people there. This, of course, improves with more data and some companies are known to be particularly good for areas or populations. The second problem is a little bit more fundamental to the scientific technique, but does overlap with the issue of sampling. Different populations have different levels of genetic variation, to the point that there are some populations in West Africa which have more genetic variation in a single tribe than you see amongst all of the people in a European country who can trace their ancestry back to that region for some number of generations. This is actually part of the anthropological evidence for migration waves out of Africa, is how much genetic variation of what you see in those kind of African populations is still carried over and when that sort of distance occurred. Mm. It means that if you take two people from one of those tribes in West Africa and you calculate their genetic similarity, depending on what you look at, they may look like they're more distantly related than two people from a European example, even if they're not, like even if they could trace their ancestry back rather more directly. I think that this is something that goes largely unacknowledged amongst the sort of marketing material from um, these these companies. They will talk about where they have good samples from, but they don't talk about this sort of genetic variation stuff, in part because it's a hard discussion to have. Like In general, people don't know how to talk about variation very much. Mm. But also, it kind of puts a lie to a lot of their claims. I mean, you can still do some of this stuff. It just means that their their estimates are a lot more uncertain than they are really willing to talk about. The statistical construction of being some percentage for a bunch of different locations is basically a weighting of these genetic similarities. So this new person would be more percentage of whatever A comes from than whatever B comes from because they have more in, in, in common in them genetically. Companies will generally distinguish results about places of origin from those about living relatives, precisely due to migration and colonization patterns, which, I mean, they have to acknowledge because those happen and people know about them. In fact, I think I mentioned that there are some which are very explicit that they are trying to give pre-colonization information, mm. which complicates this all somewhat because, of course, there's a lot of appeal to native peoples as well as to those who were transported to track those broken family ties through this sort of system. Mm -hmm. Many people feel like it's a way to shore up claims of lineage in the face of blood quantum demands, and for the descendants of transported slaves, part of understanding and reckoning with that history and their own identity can mean tracing connections back to where their ancestors were stolen from. Anthropological research really does benefit from this as well. I am just so wary of using it in the context of the gross lack of privacy protections and, and the reductive way of approaching culture and heritage, and of course, fucking capitalism, which <laughs> sees these databases as part of the data economy, right? I mean, 
aside from the use by the police, an awful lot of health insurance companies are very interested in this data because if they can incentivize, shall we say, people to do this sort of genealogical testing, they can do better risk analysis. They can maximize their profits. Of course, if you had a public health care system and didn't have any need for private companies to do this, it would be somewhat less of a problem. Capitalism. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> There are, I imagine, some indigenous-run genealogy projects, often in like assisted by or even like as part of anthropological research, who do this sort of testing in order to support like tribal communities and connect to people who have been taken away from that sort of culture. In those contexts, like keeping those databases secure, secure is often like a bit of an issue because they are a wealth of data and people who hack into healthcare databases would also be very interested in that sort of thing. Less so if it's like 30 people or something, but whatever. There's also always the temptation to sell that database because you can make money off of that data. And in fact, if you are a tribe who needs money in order to sustain yourselves, it might be quite understandably quite tempting to do. Mm. Yeah, it's it's a fraught thing, right? Because I would love for people to be able to say, come on in, let's have a go. Let's see if we can trace this back as a kind of welcoming thing. I just don't see it being used that way. And I see so many potential problems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I've always been into the idea. I don't, uh, <laughs> I've never I liked, don't trust it. <laughs> I've never liked the idea of like, yeah, spitting into a tube and sending it off to somebody on the other side of the world to go and chuck in the database just for a, a myriad of reasons. Yeah. And it, it is really popular with indigenous people here or increasingly so, but like at the same time, it's also a lot of people are weary, right? Like there's been this big talk for a long time about being weary of posting like a detailed fuck a pupper online because yes. it can be used. That information is important. Yeah, it can be used to steal your identity or for someone to sort of claim a family connection and then use that to claim land or access to, to you know, hunting and fishing rights, etc. So if you were to post like a similar thing, right, like, I can, I can, there's similar risks there. It's harder to fake your genealogy, like physical ge your genetics, I should say, not genealogy. Yeah. But at the same time, your genealogy is an all, right? And particularly within Maori culture, where you had adoption or fostering across mm. family groups. That is not seen by this system. And this is why the kind of reductive thinking where cultural inheritance is only a matter of blood, that's a problem. Yeah. And I think that my ideological interests, if you will, in, in expanding the Māori wo worldview, because I think it's really important to have those ideas out, that is enhanced by not relying on purely ancestry to bring people into a culture. Mm. And I've, I've always been uncomfortable with these DNA <laughs> yeah. companies. I've yeah. always just found it, ugh. Like, um, I, I just don't trust them. Like, no. Fundamentally, I do not trust a profit-driven system to be doing this in the interests of the people whose data it is that's being collected. Yeah. Because it never is. And there's something that's – um, I know that there's been media here around – Oh, I can't remember the exact details. Something to do with the Law Commission was seeking public consultation on DNA samples being used for investigations, right? Again, because should they be able to reach out to those DNA companies and stuff? And yeah, so this was like the cops. Yeah. To talk to. yeah. And um, there was something here that like Māori obviously are against because we are discriminated against by the system. So why do we want them to have better tools to find us right like yes. we are yeah when you when you factor in all other um elements and the only thing that differentiate us between another person uh in a particular scenario with with the justice system being race we are five times more likely to get stopped and arrested and three times more likely to get in prison yes. so it's like why like they're like <laughs> They're already good enough at <laughs> finding reasons to yeah, lock yeah. us up. We don't want to give them more ways to do it. So it's I just uh, I, I don't like it. I can again I can understand people's desire to know that, um, mm. and especially like again yeah in context that anecdote from earlier where the news presenter came back with like a high Maori rating. But it's interesting because as you said. 
immediately people are like, oh, but hold on. We know that they're not very good at categorizing people in this part of the world. And <laughs> all all they're yeah. really saying is that you're 100% Eastern Polynesian. That could mean anything. But it's like, if, if that, then yeah, what does it matter then? So what that seems like to me is that the only person that they were related to in the existing da- database was tagged as Maori. Yeah. Yeah. That's all it means. And and like I I don't say that to undermine the news presenter's Maoriness or anything. I'm just saying that that is not a good way to identify who is Maori. Mm. Yeah. I also would say that the racists who are like, oh, that doesn't mean anything. What they're saying is they're doing it in bad faith, right? They're yeah. not there for the right reasons and fuck those people. Yeah. Because as far as I'm concerned, 100% Maori doesn't mean anything. <laughs> no. No. And that's also what she said. She goes, I don't really care about this because I already knew I was Maori. Yes. I didn't need some company to tell me that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, like, yeah. I know it's a thing that's, um, as people get older, especially, right? Like all the people I know who are into these DNA tests and are really into the family trees tend to be sort of, you know, grandparent age. Mm. I guess as you get older, you start thinking a bit more about where you came from and and what's going with you. You're not what knowledge is going with you when you pass on. So I guess there's a degree of that, but meh. yeah. So I find that kind of really interesting, particularly in the context of Maori people with. The, the oral history and things is that now we have ways to make records of oral histories that did not exist a hundred years ago. Yeah, and I wonder h- how much that will be used to capture this knowledge before it, it kind of disappears or whatever. Because we no longer have the kind of family environments where that teaching happens. Yeah, there is a real risk of of knowledge being lost. I do think that. For some grandparents in particular, some of it is also finally they are in an environment where they are not being shamed for this. Mm. My mum told me, overhearing her mum, getting told, oh, you're lucky it doesn't show much in your kids mm. with regards to like Maori ancestry and things. So that that is living memory. Yeah. And I, I think you, you told me, Liam, that within New Zealand, part of the discussion among about like Maori language recovery and te reo Maori and things like that and use of it is that there are people who remember being beaten for speaking Maori. Yeah, my grandfather was beaten yeah. at school for speaking it, and that was a big part of us reclaiming it. So he was beaten at school for speaking it, so my mother wasn't taught it. Yeah. And Bo, he was given an English name as well because they mm. didn't want to disadvantage him getting into work with a Maori name, and then he didn't pass on. So that was a, a part of the culture that wasn't passed on, and then he mm. didn't teach his children to do Maori because it didn't help him and he had a beaten out of him at school. Um, and then naturally I didn't learn it. And so, and yeah. now I'm in the process of reclaiming it. Like it's, it's, it's regaining our culture. Right. And, and so I think there are some people out there that, you know, this being this openness to being able to claim this stuff, through a process like you know like something as undeniable quote unquote as dna is often presented to be yeah it's like well look at this yeah yeah <laughs> i told you i got fuck a puppet it's right here whereas in reality we never needed that our tupuna didn't give a shit about that <laughs> like, well, I, yeah. I, I mean look i completely understand somebody using it because they feel insecure in that identity and particularly if they are questioned in that identity, I completely understand. I'm not going to say somebody's a bad person for doing it, mm. but I think we need better structures and better better structures to bring people into families and into culture than relying on them going and doing this. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I th- yeah, and just. Yeah, there's a lot of things we need <laughs> to be completely yeah, yeah. honest. And the child removal and the family separation and things is a really, really evil sort of stuff because it means that the first time somebody finds out that they have fucker papa may be doing this incidentally. Yeah, well, and, and that's that's that absolutely happened. I've seen stories about that online. Yeah. Um, and let's, you know, it's, it is a thing that like people then start, well, for example, one of my co-workers was adopted um, mm. by Pākehā, and she's like visually Māori, there's no denying it. Um, and she's always growing up not really knowing uh, her whakapapa, and unfortunately for her, her parents, uh, when she reached out for them, 
you know, refused contact. Um, mm. So she's having to sort of try and understand her place in the world without knowing a fucker papa. It's actually like you can see how big a struggle that makes it, you know, for Yeah, and for it's her. so hard and mm. it's re-traumatizing, I think, for a lot of people. Yeah. Yeah, like so, so I sit there and I'm – I'm quite confident in my te ao I don't know if that comes across, <laughs> but I'm, I'm quite confident. No, really? in that. And I'll, I'll, I talk about all these concepts, and I can see that because she doesn't have that innate understanding of her place in it, it just yeah washes over her head. Right? I just think that that's 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 colonization in action. Yes. Right. Like that's that's this whole point in action. Because again, like I mean, it's one of those things where the the people who would preach about blood quantum because she was adopted by white people would instead turn around and go, well, it doesn't matter what percentage multi she was, she doesn't have a culture anyway, so she's effectively one of us. Yes. If they wanted, you know, like like you know what I mean. So it's like we don't we don't need the shit. So uh, Patrick Wolf talks about this as the logic of elimination, where. Every tool, every argument is used to deny or otherwise minimize the connection that indigenous people have to their cultures. Yeah. Also, one thing I think is important to state about fuck a papa is while we say, look, if you fuck a papa Māori, you are Māori, there is a, a, a way of thinking here within Māori society, which is, are you a practicing Māori? And what I mean by that is some people will know they have a Māori tupuna, but they don't want to engage with their fuck a papa. In which case, that's fine. Like, there's no expectation upon you that you have to do that. Just don't then turn around and claim. And use it as an argument. Yeah. yeah um, because it's kind of like, you know, it's something that we think is a treasure, but not everyone necessarily does that. And in our history, there has been examples of Tupuna who have deliberately sort of turned their back on one part of a whakapapa and gone in a new direction. And often that's the result of it. Like, that's when new tribes and stuff are founded, right? It is kind of like this thing that, you know, whether you engage with it or not is up to you. Um, but it's just a shame that for so many people, they're not given that, that option. And for a big part of our history, they weren't given that option because they were told, well, no, look, you're only actually this percentage, so it doesn't matter. Yes. And I do worry that there's going to be people out there who, with these 23andMe's and Ancestry.com's, so on and so forth, um, they may do a test you know, go spit in the tube, send it off, and then go, oh, well, I'm only 15%, so I won't worry. That's wor not worth really chasing up. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to worry about that. Whereas it says I'm 60% English. Let's ignore the fact that if you're English, that also likely means that you've got a bit of Roman in there, potentially a bit yeah. of German, you know, Germanic peoples in there, some Danish at some point along the line. Let's ignore all of that <laughs> and just say we are English. <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, so that's one of the interesting things about like 23andMe is better at at breaking down those sorts of historical relationships. Mm, okay. This is why 23andMe is considered particularly good for Northern European stuff mm. because it has such an interesting database of like quite dense samples across there. Yeah. But elsewhere doesn't do much. So there it's like <laughs> it'll break down, oh you know, you, you there's a bit of bit of bit of uh, Celtic in there and a wee bit of Germanic and a bit of Danish, but over here it's like, oh you are brown. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> pretty oh, much. Really? Yeah, yeah. I couldn't tell. <laughs> like, <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, man. This is also why, like, in colonized areas, those percentages are so fraught mm -hmm. because, like, what looks to them like 5%, like, Māori doesn't necessarily represent actual components. Yeah. It's just based on this sampling stuff. So the the percentages are a little bit um problematic, let's say. I got a couple I got a couple of quick anecdotes I want to rattle off because I know that at oh, some God. at some point you're gonna think about finishing this up. I think when it comes to these indigenous worldviews, there's something that we should seriously look at for how we engage with our not just our personal histories, but our shared histories, right? So mm. uh in the New Zealand I'll use its colonial name. In New Zealand, Pākehā here, or you know, New Zealand Europeans, as some of them prefer to be called, or Kiwis, as they prefer to be called, because they want to get called Pākehā, not that Māori world, we use the other one. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, Pākehā, Kiwi, NZ Euro, whatever you call them. Often, because the, of our complex history here, don't have a sense of their own actual history and heritage beyond their yes. grandparents. And a part of that, I think, is a subconscious 
sort of turning away from the complexity of our history because one, it wasn't New Zealanders that came here and displaced the Māori, it was the English. And we're not English, we're New Zealanders, we're Kiwi. And two, it's a confronting thing to look back at and go, oh, well, that farm that my grandfather, you know, we used to go visit him on when I was a kid, uh, was actually stolen land. And the people who lived there weren't allowed to go back. I mean, matter of fact, those poor Māori that used to work as fields were the original inhabitants of that land. And, you know, yeah. like, and that, that's quite confronting so people don't look back and as a result we have this complex societal relationship where you've got one part of the culture of society saying these horrible things have happened what are you doing about it and the other half is burying their head in the sand and the the fact of the matter is if they actually stopped and adopted a bit of a te Māori worldview embraced their whakapapa not only would they gain a heritage gain a history because they're two puna you know, despite everything, did make their way around the world and brought culture and history and stuff with them and came here mm. and we created a shared culture together, right? There is a beauty to that. There is some good things amongst all these bad things here that we should celebrate, but at the moment we don't because we don't want to have that conversation. If they had, if they took on a te ao Māori worldview, took on papa, we could actually have those difficult conversations that we as a society have to have eventually. Mm. They're going to happen eventually. So it's just a matter of when. We could get them out of the way and then start working on an Aotearoa together going forward. And I think Pākehā ha- only have stuff to gain from this. You have a history to gain. You have people to look back on. Why did your ancestor decide to come here? There's this bound to be a story there. It might be because they're fleeing from debts or whatever. Or it might be because they genuinely wanted to come around the world and start a crack at a, at a better life or maybe you know, whatever there's bound to be some stories there so we should look into that and learn about that because they are you yeah you know? i feel like that happens a lot here as well because like white, white australians are very willing to well, shall we say the um anti-racist white australians i'll frame it in that sense are very willing to kind of denigrate their own sense of identity or say that they don't have culture and this sort of thing. I mean, you do. Mm. It's just that recognizing the role that your existence and your history has played in the colonization project and these sorts of things doesn't mean that you are a bad person. No. And I think that, like, that that aspect of it and the fact that while you are the product of this environment, I mean – I am a person who is the product of the colonization of New Zealand as well as, you know, Māori people there. Recognizing that does not have kind of a, a moral stain on my being as a result. Mm. It just comes with a moral obligation to do something about the existing structures. And that's the hard bit. Yeah. Well, also, like, so from, I'm also a product of colonization, right? I have fucker papa up to Nati Kainuni and Wairoa, but I also have fucker papa back to Northern Ireland. I'm not. Uh, another famous, in, famously interesting <laughs> example of <laughs> yeah. colonization and racialization. Yeah. yeah. I don't, I'm not practicing in my Irish heritage as such, right? <laughs> but they, they yeah. are sort of, you know, it is a part of me. Um, but like, mm. I do feel like, again, yeah, people don't want to acknowledge this stuff because they're embarrassed about this history. But I mean, if, you know, again, if, you actually stopped in and considered it, considered your place in it, or one, you'd gain a sense of place in the world, right? Which yes. at the moment people sort of shy away from because they know that if they don't do anything about it, the answer to it is, well, my sense of place in the world is the beneficiary and and uh, and and privileged holder of you know, benefits of colonisation, right? And that's that's yes. a it's an intimidating thing to admit, especially when we live in this Western fictitious idea of a meritocracy um so that's quite intimidating um but also i think really it should be empowering going going on this journey as as much as it's like it's empowering for me to to have studied a bit of decolonization and to look at how fucking disgusting our history was it was still empowering to know despite that i am here yeah, and it's not what happened in the past that matters, it's what we do going forward. And I think more people need to do that on both sides of that sort of racial split. Yeah. So that's one of the two things I wanted to say, and that's probably the most poignant. The second one is something which I find really interesting. Is I've forgotten her name, unfortunately, but there's this famous case in New Zealand back in the 19th century of um, during one of the land spats between Māori and, and colonisers, where often what would happen is 
organizations like the New Zealand Company. There's a guy called, um, and uh, I don't remember his first name, but a fellow called uh, Wakefield who famously sold heaps of land he didn't own. Uh, and mm. these settlers would turn up here, having paid for it back in the UK, would arrive here and be like, well, fuck, we spent our whole life savings on that. We're going to go and build on this land. It's ours, you know, and then yeah. that would lead to squabbles, right? So in one of those situations um, where the... Uh, patriarch of that particular settler family went off and, and fought against the local iwi and then that didn't go very well for him and he ended up um, mm. they ended up turning up at their property he was gone at that point he was done in and they reclaimed that particular patch of land and in the process um, the family his, his wife and children etc were taken in uh, as prisoners and uh, that didn't last very long before she became a part of that particular iwi. This is, an, I think she was Irish or somewhere back in the UK. She became a part of, of this tribe, as did her children. She married one of the prominent members of the tribe and was a revered member of the tribe without a single drop of Māori blood. Eventually, she was discovered by, like we're talking over a decade later, was discovered by some settlers among, living amongst these Māori people where they immediately declared that she was a slave. She had been, And to be fair, that may have been true for a period, um, although slavery within Māori society was uh, not like a transactional slavery like it was in, in with, you know, so, and it wasn't chattel slavery no, yeah, either, which yeah. is radically different. So she may have been a prisoner and a slave for a while, but eventually married someone with some status and just become a member of the tribe and their children were raised as members of the tribe and they could speak the language and they were a part of the tribe, etc. But obviously that, was, that wasn't that was acceptable to the um, settlers. They got very upset about it and there was a bit of a kerfuffle. Mm. But I find it interesting that this woman, whose husband fought against the Māori, she was born on the other end of the world, was able to to be adopted into a tribe and carry their mana and be looked up to as a respected member of that tribe, despite having 0% of Māori blood, right? Mm. Uh, I think that is the sort of thing that we should look to is like, well, hold on, this can kind of, there is a place here, right, for our for our societal underpinnings beyond just, you know. Conflict. Yeah, and also quantum, right? Like, it doesn't fucking matter. Yeah. It doesn't matter. Like, <laughs> seriously, no, no one gives a shit. It doesn't fucking matter. <laughs> you know, there's better ways to do this, papa and other structural things. And I don't want to act like papa's the best. It's just the one I happen to know. I'm sure other cultures around the world have got their own models of looking at this stuff. Um which is excellent, but, you know, there's, there's better ways of thinking about it. And that also means that for the Pākehā people in New Zealand, for the Kiwis, if they wish to be called that, there are roots to anti-colonialism which don't just involve, like, shame and slight awkwardness about the current state of things and that. There is a, like, unified future which is bright and interesting and does not involve the sorts of like damaging things that colonization has done to the land and the people. And there can be steps towards that that people can take now. Not only that, we know what their future is because it's on a piece of paper that we all fucking signed in the yeah. 1840s, right? Like the treaty, the, the thing that we originally agreed to when Māori were like, okay, then come on in. You know, uh, when we outnumbered you know, people here massively and, and we agreed to the shared vision of a nation that was actually pretty awesome. This idea of us living in harmony together, going forward together as a peoples and accepting a multicultural society. We don't need to create a new thing here. It was It was already thought up. All those, you know, a long time ago, nearly 200 years ago, 180 years ago, right? We just need to honour that. We actually have a term for that here. So, you know, I've been using the term Pākehā, um, and there's also Tōiwi, which is like non-New Zealander. But there's a term called Tangata Tiriti, right? So Tangata means person, and that's most often used in the framing of Tangata Whenua, so person of the land, Māori. And then there's Tangata Tiriti, so people who are here by decree or by you know um the benefit of the treaty mm. now we use that to mean ally yeah if you're a tangata tititi you are someone who is here and you acknowledge the treaty and want to live that way that's what we want we don't want 
to <laughs> like, like if, if, if people did that, if Pākehā started doing that tomorrow, then immediately everyone's happy because then we're actually working side by side. It's not about superiority anymore. So the, you know, the structure is there. And it has been for a long time. We're quite fortunate, actually, that we have that treaty document for us to point to. Because, yeah, I mean, again, we look across the ditch. Not everybody necessarily had yeah. that. We are fortunate to have that framework there. We don't need to start uh, like a whole new model. People seem to think it's really complex. It's not. Just do what you bloody agreed to in the first place. And we'll be fine. So it is It is interesting in the Australian context because at the moment, the, well, it's going gonna, it's gonna to increase in intensity as we go forward. There's a whole discussion about an Indigenous voice to Parliament, which a lot of Indigenous activists, particularly the more like left-wing radical ones, have said, no, we don't want a voice to Parliament. We want sovereignty. We want a treaty. And then we can start talking about that. Mm. I, I can see that all of this blood quantum stuff is going to be emphasised, shall we say, in the coming discourse around this as who has the right to talk about this and who has the right to talk about it in what ways gets litigated in the white people's press. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, that's where the power is. Especially in Australia. I lived very briefly in Australia, right? And it made me really uncomfortable. You guys have got yeah. a, you, you got a lot of historical trauma you need to work through. <laughs> like, <laughs> that's a very good way of putting yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but now I, you know, I stand in solidarity with uh, with our Indigenous brothers and sisters over there, eh? Because, um, you know, it is, yeah. we are fortunate here, I think, that we've been, we are often held up as one of the model Indigenous peoples out there to follow when trying to gain sovereignty, right? Because we started this scrap quite, you know, a while ago. Um, and we were fortunate mm. that we got got colonized later than others so colonization was less set in place when we started that fight i do i do think it's important to say here that like indigenous australians have fought since the beginning mm. and like the the way that the frontier wars happened here well the i mean the literal material conditions even down to the geography were very radically different yeah. the language was much more you had much more diversity of languages over here than in New Zealand, mm -hmm. well, in Aotearoa, I should say. So Māori, Aotearoa Māori, it was much easier to get a unified group of tribes together, a group of nations together to say, this is what we want. In Australia, it's slightly bigger, let's say. So the, the sheer process of trying to go around and talk to all of those people to get a group together was very difficult, impossible with the um, existing like technology and things. And the language was uh, a much more of a barrier. I mean, tribes did communicate, of course. They even, there were instances of pidgin languages. So these are kind of, we, we have creoles now or pigeons now as something where you get like a, a like slaves developed a creole when subjected to slavery because they had to communicate. Well, you also have pigeons and creoles emerging as kind of a trading language that two different language groups would use because, well, they want to trade, so we've got to do this somehow. Mm -hmm. And those existed and ways of communicating existed to allow people to travel across different tribal lands and things, but it was much, much harder to get groups together to fight. So you did have smaller groups uniting into unified armies to fight the colonizers, but it didn't happen the same way. And because the English were somewhat more able to send people here and more able to get established than they were in New Zealand, which was a little more densely populated than a lot of the areas are here, mm -hmm. that experience of colonization and that ability to resist was very radically different between the two. Yeah, yeah, no, we definitely. We definitely were quite fortunate. Us and the other big Indigenous group a lot of people always point to is in Canada with the First Nations mm. there. They've been quite fortunate to have a lot of sort of legal successes in the last hundred years or so. And we often go there and ask them, well, how'd you do this? How'd you do that? Et cetera. It's actually, we're seeing a lot more Indigenous communities working together because especially those of us... Solidarity works. Yeah, and especially when ultimately we're all talking, we're all living in countries with Westminster systems. So if, if it yeah. works in one, it will work in the others. It's just getting it across the line. I always love it when I see this sort of stuff happening overseas. I, uh, if, mm. I've always thought, hey, if I had the means, if I had unlimited means, every time I see some Indigenous protest somewhere in the world, I'd go there in a heartbeat. I'd gather up yeah, all yeah. the most fierce sort of Māori kapapa group I could find and go rock a haka. 
go over the. And the well, because it's like take your guitar too in the air, but you can drown out some well, it's, like races. But also, it makes it like an international thing. So when you get what when you yeah. get what happens at like say Standing Rock, where the police turn against the people, if they do that against some international people who are there protesting, suddenly you're drawing attention to something because oh yeah we're not their people to oppress so I, I do think we need to see more of that but um nah anyway it's hard because it's a long way to travel it is. but you're not power, power yeah. to uh power to our brothers and sisters over there i'm sure i'm sure you know you'll uh they'll get there eventually i hope so and i will i intend to help if i can Anyway, Liam, this has been a very long one, actually, of course. We both got to talking. Thank you so much for coming on. No, thank you for having me. It was good. Where can people find you? Oh, um, <laughs> well. We'll post some links underneath, but if you want to just describe. Yeah, I've good. got a Twitter. I don't know how much longer that'll be around. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If, uh, <laughs> on, on Twitter, actually, I, uh, I very recently, uh, just last week, went sort of viral, um, taking a... Um, a Western game publisher to task for publishing some really racist game supplements uh, about Polynesia. Nice. And I, I went through effectively page by page and discredited <laughs> the book. And um, <laughs> it, and it, it, it's a big thread, over 100 posts, but it was um, it, it kind of took off and, and it's got me lots of trolls coming and giving me a hard time. So if you'd like to, definitely come and come there. I'll, I don't know the, the handle off the top of my head, but there'll be a link below. Yep. Or if you want to find all my stuff, really, www.toatabletop.com. It's really nerdy and geeky. It's about my game design stuff, and it's out of date because I haven't updated it, but it's a, it's got <laughs> links to all of my stuff. And I'm always happy to talk about this. I do sort of consultation on you know, decolonizational and, and, and mon, you know, sort of Māori stuff, bits and pieces. I, I enjoy talking about these bits and pieces quite a bit. No, really? Yeah. <laughs> and, <I'm, laughs> and, and you may have noticed I'm prone to being quite verbose. But, um, um, <laughs> That's why you have a podcast, yes, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. Also named for <laughs> Tabletop. We're talking about role play games, but since I took over, I used to be a co-host situation but since i took over mm. we're talking about games but when we're, we're not we're, we're really talking about <laughs> the world that we live in and all the same stuff you've heard today so I'm, I'm quite fortunate to talk to guests from all around the place i i'm in the process of trying to secure a maori anthropologist who's also a gamer Ooh. to come on and talk to me about this book that i you know um had a go at last week that'll be fun so yeah she's um it's not in the bag yet, so I don't want to go into too much information and name <laughs> yeah, her yeah, stuff. Yeah. But like, if I can get this woman on, oh man, I think it'll be one of my best episodes ever. She's um, she's on to it. It would be it'd be great. So that's the sort of stuff I like to do, and occasionally talk about other sort of game stuff as well. Fantastic. So my podcast also has a Patreon. So if you are listening to this for the first time and think that it may be worth your money, please go over to patreoncom statisticallyinsignificant. insignificant. There will be a link below as well, and maybe throw some money at me or something like that. Thank you again. Liam for coming on. I'll see you later. Mm, thank you. See you later.